for Blue by Closest, event number two. So my name is uh, Benjamin Thibaud Dury, and I'm the co-founder of Closest, which is a sustainable marketplace with Julie Thibaud Dury. Uh, and I will be your host for this special event. And I would like to thank you, uh, Julie, because she gave me this opportunity to host this event today, and I'm really happy for this opportunity. So today we are celebrating World Way Day, and we are thrilled to have you all here with us today. So Green for Blue is a guide for learning more about sustainable possibilities in New York City. And it's been, it's been our mission since we started uh, back in September 2022. So our mission is to interview New Yorkers who make a difference every day to fight climate change and protect our environment. The name Green for Blue is a reference to a closest donation program in favor of ocean protection, which we call Shop Green for the Blue. So today we are honored to have two incredible speakers with us uh, who are dedicated to the protection of our oceans and environment. Our first speaker is Captain Paul Watson, a uh, marine, marine wildlife conservationist and environmental activist who was one of the founding members and direct directors of Greenpeace. So in 1977, he founded the Sea Shepherd Conservation Soci Society, and he has since dedicated his life to the protection of marine life through multiple actions. He has recently founded the Captain Paul Watson Foundation, to continue his fight for marine wildlife conservation. And we're gonna talk about it in a few minutes. Uh, our second speaker is Emily McGlone, director of New York-based Office of Peace Boat US, a nonprofit organization working to promote peace, sustainable development, and respect for the environment through educational program organized on board the Peace Boat. Uh, Emily, you currently serve as a United Nations liaison, Peace Boat holds special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. So we are excited to have you with us today. Thank you for joining and let's get started. Um, so today we'll begin with you, um, Paul Watson, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, then everybody can actually see you. Um, so welcome, Captain Paul Watson. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, it's an honor for me, you know, um, to have you here today with us. I first heard, uh, heard about you and C. Shepherd uh, a little more than 10 years ago when I discovered um, the famous TV show, Wild Wars. And um, I was already fascinated by the ocean, but I have to say I was very impressed by what you were uh, willing to do to protect the whales. And um, Paul, what, what inspired you to dedicate your life to protecting marine life and the oceans? Well, that's a long story, but uh, you know, when I, <laughs> I was raised in a, a Eastern Canadian uh, fishing village and when I was 10 years old, I uh, spent the whole summer swimming with a family of beavers, and uh, that was great. But the next summer, when I went to visit them again, they were gone. Trappers had taken them out. That made me very angry. So that winter, I began to walk trap lines and free animals and destroy the traps. And then in uh, 1969, I was the youngest founding member of Greenpeace. And uh, so I've been doing this really all my, all my life uh, with a specific uh, strategy, which I call aggressive non-violence we're not going to hurt anybody but we're going to aggressively intervene mm -hmm. yeah that's that's what we were seeing actually in the um, in the whale was show like um i i i i wonder what what the whales precisely like because you were there to protect the whales uh, why the whales in 1975, June of 1975, to be specific, uh, I was with uh, Greenpeace and Robert Hunter and I were in a small inflatable boat uh, uh, trying to stop a Soviet harpoon vessel in the North Pacific. Uh, we were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, and we thought that all we had to do was put our bodies between the harpoons and the whales, and that would be successful. Mm -hmm. And it for about 20 minutes until the uh, captain came running down the catwalk and screamed into the ear of the harpooner, then looked down on us, smiled, brought his finger across his throat, 
And uh, that's when I realized Gandhi wasn't going to work for us uh, that day. Yeah. Uh, a few moments later, there's a horrendous explosion, and this harpoon flew over our head, uh, slammed into the backside of one of the of eight uh, sperm whales that were fleeing for their life in front of us. And uh, the whale that was struck uh, rolled on her side, screamed. I didn't even know whales could scream and blood everywhere. And suddenly the largest whale in the pod rose up, slapped the water with his tail, disappeared and swam directly underneath of us and threw himself at the bow of the harpooner to protect his pod. But they were wow. waiting for him with an unattached harpoon. The harpooner pulled the trigger, hit him point blank in the head. He fell back in the water in agony, thrashing about blood everywhere. And as I, I watched this, he suddenly looked straight at me and then dove and I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming at us real fast. And he came up and out of the water at an angle so that the next move was to come forward and crash down upon us, killing us. But as his head rose out of the sea and I looked into this eye, the size of my fist, I saw I, I, so close I could see my own reflection in that eye. I saw something that really changed my life forever. And that was understanding. That whale understood what we were trying to do because I could see the effort that he made to pull himself back. And instead of crashing down upon us, he began to slide backwards into the sea. I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface and he died. He could have killed us, but he spared our lives. So I owe my life to that whale. Mm -hmm. But also I saw something else in there that was really life changing. And that was uh, pity, not for himself, but for us, that we could take life so thoughtlessly so remorsely and why were the russians killing these whales they didn't eat them they killed them for oil sperm oil spermaceti oil and uh, it was a highly prized uh, high heat resistant oil and one of the things that it was most highly prized for was the construction and maintenance of intercontinental ballistic missiles and i said to myself here we are killing this incredibly intelligent socially uh complex uh self-aware sentient being for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it hit me right there on that small boat in the North Pacific. We're insane. We're ecologically, we're completely insane. And I mm. said to myself, never again am I gonna do this for people. I do this for them. I do this for the whales and the dolphins and the other creatures of the sea. Yeah. So years later, uh, in 1986, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet. We destroyed their whale processing plant. We shut them down for years. And I had a former colleague from Greenpeace come to me and he said, I just want to know, let you know that what you did in Iceland was reprehensible, unacceptable, irresponsible. And I said, yeah, yeah, so what? He says, aren't, don't, aren't you concerned about what people think of you? I said, no, not at all. We didn't sink those uh, whaling ships for you. We sank them for the whales. Find me yeah. a whale that agrees with what we do and I promise we won't do it again. But that's what motivates us. We fight for our clients in the sea. We don't do this for people. We don't do this to impress people. We don't really care if people support us or not. If they choose to do so, we certainly welcome that support. But as far as criticisms of what we do, we're not interested because we're saving lives and that's what's important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's incredible. Like, wow. What a, what a story. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that's great what you're doing. Like, like as you mentioned, like you you don't care what whatever people think about you or what they have to say. You just you're doing this for the whales, and and that's remarkable. That's that's incredible. And um, I, I've seen many times that you. I mean, you always say that if the ocean dies, we die. And why is this, is it so important and to, I mean, protect the ocean. I mean, it's obvious, but uh, yeah. that, that, that expression is... <laughs> it's not really obvious, it's absolutely essential. Uh, since 1950, the year I was born, uh, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton po populations in the sea. You can look it up, Scientific America 2010 did the first study on it. Now, what does that mean? Diminishment of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe and sequesters enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. If phytoplankton is removed from the sea, we die. We do not live in a world without phytoplankton. It produces more oxygen than all the trees on the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and why is that diminishment happening? Because we're killing whales and dolphins and fish and, and, sea, sea, uh, and seabirds. They provide the nutrient base for the phytoplankton. Phytoplankton needs nutrients like magnesium, nitrogen, iron, all that are supplied by the feces of these animals. 
Whales are literally the farmers of the ocean and they're fertilizing the crop called phytoplankton. Every day, one blue whale alone defecates three tons of manure which floats on the surface, which provides that nutrient base. You wipe out the whales, you wipe out the dolphins, you wipe out the seabirds, you wipe out phytoplankton. And when phytoplankton dies, we die. And that's why I say if the ocean dies, we die. And the ocean is dying. The problem is people don't even know what phytoplankton is, let it alone no. know how important it is. But they also don't want to know what the ocean is. We think of the ocean generally as the sea. It's out there, the sea. The ocean is more than that. We are really. Uh, the ocean is water in constant circulation through different mediums. It always has been that way. Sometimes it's in the sea, sometimes it's in the atmosphere, sometimes it's in the ice, sometimes it's underground, and sometimes it's in the cells of every living plant and animal. The ocean flu flows through us every single day. We are the ocean. We're connected. Everything is connected. Uh, we have to take a biocentric approach to this. Everything is connected. And the laws of ecology, that the strength of an ecosystem are defined by the diversity within it, the law of interdependence, that all those species are interdependent with each other, and the law of finite resources, that everything is, you know, there is a carrying capacity is being stolen by one species, us. And there's only so much you can take away before those other species begin to disappear. Look at it this way. The Earth is a spaceship. It's on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy, and every spaceship has a life support system. And that life support system provides us with everything we need, the food we eat, the air we breathe, regulates climate and temperature. And that life support system is operated and maintained by a crew of engineers who are working tirelessly every single day to keep it running. And uh, we're, we're not those engineers. We humans, we're passengers. We're having a wonderful time entertaining ourselves. But what, what, what are we doing? We're killing the engineers. We're killing them off. The worms, yeah. the, the fish, the bacterium, the, the phytoplankton, we're killing off the engineers. And there's only so many engineers you can kill before the uh, machinery begins to fall apart. And that results in ecological collapse. And that means the death of humanity. Hmm. Um, recently, some uh, whales have been, I don't know if you heard about it, I guess, yes, uh, been spotted in uh, New York City Harbor. Do you, do you think it's a good thing? <laughs> no, well, certainly not a good thing, but I know why it's happening. And I know why nobody wants to talk about it. It's because of the uh, construction of offshore windmills, uh, which are incredible high decibel levels from the, from the, uh, the pile driving to construct these things. And uh, so it's no coincidence that the whales are dying in the exact same area that the construction of these windmills is taking place. Mm -hmm. So we tried, uh, we, we started a campaign to oppose this, and my former organization, Sea Shepherd, shut it down. Nobody wants to talk about it because, well, that's green energy, that's alternative energy. We can't criticize it. Yeah. It is, those windmills are killing those whales, and it's happening not just here, it's happening in France, it's happening in other places. And uh, in other words, what we do, we accept uh, the, uh, the destruction in the name of, you know, green alternatives. Like, you know, so everybody wants to do an electric car, but where, where the hell, do, what do electric cars run on? They run on electricity. Where's that electricity come from? Coal-fired generating plants, uh, nuclear power plants, whatever. I mean, I don't see that as an alternative. The problem yeah. is too many people using too many uh, resources and trying to find uh, uh, bright green solutions that have <laughs> are really no solutions at all. Yeah, I think there's a lot of greenwashing around that. It's always this uh, border between is it like you? it's pretending to be green and at the same time, is that really good for the environment? And most of the, like you talk about the, um, the battery on the electric cars, it looks like a great thing, but what are we going to do uh, with the batteries when when they are useless you know it's so it's just going to cause more pollution so that's probably not not the, the solution actually well the worst part is nobody wants to talk about it you yeah know? nobody no wants absolutely to nobody yeah wants to it. like you said it's just in the name of it's green so that's that's wonderful but it is not that green like who makes the battery how do they how do we make them and maybe it causes more pollution that the actual engine that we're using well why not I, I mean maybe not but you know you, we can question that at some point 
should be able to question it. I mean, back in 1990 at the United Nations Conference on the Environment, Gro Harlem Brundtland, the Prime Minister of Norway, came up with this thing called sustainability. And that was good, except everything today is sustainable. Sustainable fishing, sustainable logging. Just put the word sustainable on it and it's business as usual. You know, there is no sustainable fishing industry on this planet anymore, anywhere. You know, the fishing industry is destroying the planet with super trawlers, 100 mile long long lines, 100 mile long gill nets, purse saners. Uh, there are industrialized, mechanized destruction of life in the ocean, and it's going on out of seat, not out of sight, and out of mind. 40% of all of the fish that are being taken are taken illegally, and 40% of the fish taken legally or illegally are not even eaten by people. They're turned into fish meal to feed chickens and pigs and, and animals on factory farms. Now they want to go down and harvest, as they call it, millions of tons of krill, that is the uh, uh, the zooplankton in the Southern Ocean. They're doing that right now without any ecological uh, re research at all. And why are they doing it? To make a protein paste for the 80 billion animals a year that we kill in factory farms. That's why they're doing it. I mean, it's all for profit. It's short-term investment, short-term game. They are killing the ocean. And we're just sitting here like, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, at least we got uh, a lot of salmon. Uh, except that they're raised on salmon farms and fed with the fish and the fish meal that they get from the ocean. Uh, it's, a, it's an illusion that we're doing the right thing or not. Uh, yeah. and we have to, we have to uh, adopt a biocentric point of view. That is this understanding that everything is connected. Everything is, you know, part of everything else. For the last few thousand years, many thousands of years, we've had this anthropocentric point of view, which is it's all about us. It was all created for us. Everything is about us. Uh, all our religions, every single uh, major religion is anthropocentric that makes us in the image of God. We've created this God that we are now the image of and God created it all for us. Although the planet has been around for 4 billion years and we've only been around for 200,000 years and in the present form of civilization, less than 10,000. But we believe it was all created just for us, for our use. And in that name, we are able to really destroy and utilize and abuse every other living thing on this planet. And that is what I find absolutely, totally unacceptable. Well, um, the, yeah, uh, again, it's, it's great what you're doing. Um, let, let's talk about the Captain Walt. Um, Paul Watson Foundation. I mean, this is your new project, and yeah. um, and what's what, what's the purpose of that foundation? Well, the purpose of the uh, the Captain Paul Watson Foundation is to carry on the work I've been doing for the last uh, fifty years. Uh, in last June, uh, you know, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society that I founded and, and built up. Um, was slowly over the last few years taken over the board of directors. It was a hostile takeover. And in June, I was brought before the board of directors and I was told that we're going in a different direction. You're too controversial. You're too confrontational. We're going to work with governments. We're going to work with corporations. I said, I'm not going to do that. There's no way I'm going to do that. And they said, mm -hmm. basically, the board said, you're an employee of Sea Shepherd. You do what you're told. I said, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I don't do that. They offered me this huge salary just to be a, a figurehead that says nothing, posts nothing, does not do interviews. And uh, so I said, I don't need that. I didn't get involved in the money. You know, I don't care what you offer me on, on this, you know, and but they took control of it. Now they're saying they're suing me, saying I have no right to use the, the logo or the name, which I've not been doing. But now they're suing me. They saying I have no right to use my own name because it's too closely associated with Sea Shepherd causing confusion amongst their so-called supporters who really don't even know what's going on. Anyway, so I set up the Captain Paul Watson Foundation to carry on what we've been doing. We've already secured our first ship. We're gonna be bringing that ship to uh, New York Harbor uh, in late May. And from there- Oh, that's great. Yeah, and from there, we're gonna be launching Operation Payakan uh, to Iceland to protect endangered fin whales, which are being hunted uh, by this guy called Christian Lawson. The reason I'm calling it Payakan is because I don't know if you saw Avatar, but the hero whale in the movie is called Payakan. But mm -hmm. also Payakan was a close friend of mine, uh, was the chief of the Kayapo nation in, the, in Amazonia. And I believe James Cameron took that name from Payakan in, in honor of Payakan. So that's why we're calling it, we're calling it Operation Pyakon. 
Yeah, I, wa I was about to ask you about the, the John Paul de, de Joria too. So where is the boat at, at the moment? Uh, the boat is in the, in the United Kingdom right now, and uh, it goes into dry dock uh, within the month, and it'll all be, it'll be ready to sail to New York in the early May and uh, to the Leap, Leaper Iceland in late May. Uh, what happened is that uh, John Paul de Joria uh, called me and he said, because we had a boat with Sea Shepherd named the John Paul de Joria. They, mm -hmm. just scrapped, they just scrapped that boat for no reason whatsoever. And when he called them up and asked them, why did you scrap the boat? They said, well, I was getting old, and which it wasn't. And uh, he said, well, why didn't you just give it to Paul Watson? And they said, the board of directors of Sea Shepherd USA, well, we offered it to him, but he turned it down. I said, that's a lie. They never even spoke to me. So he said, mm -hmm. find me a boat. I'll buy it for you. And I found a boat and he bought it for us. And that's the John Paul de Joria. We're also looking for a second boat. And we also have a, a vessel that, uh, a smaller vessel, a river boat in the Amazon to protect the, uh, the boat, uh, the Amazon River Dolphins. So we're building up the Navy again. And actually to tell you the truth, I feel liberated, inspired and motivated. The organization that I created Sea Shepherd became because of the success of, sea, of whale wars primarily became very large and had brought in a lot of money and that corrupts. And uh, yeah. I suddenly found myself uh, being encumbered by a bureaucracy that just surrounded me and uh, you know I had to deal with. I don't have that bureaucracy now. I have the freedom I, I need. I have the freedom that uh, is required to be able to do the things that I have done. I was told yeah. by the board of directors of Sea Shepherd, I was too controversial. I was too confrontational. I was an embarrassment. My history was an embarrassment to Sea Shepherd. And I said, well, that's too bad. I'll continue to be an embarrassment. I'll continue to be controversial. That's what I do. That's what I've always done. And, uh, you know, because we got to rock the boat. We got to make waves. We gotta, you know, the, the job of a conservationist is to piss people off, to say things yeah. that people don't want to hear, to do things that people don't want to be seen done and to get things done to save lives and protect habitats. And, and that's that's what we're doing. And we operate within the boundaries of practicality. And we also operate within the boundaries of the law. I've never been convicted of a felony crime, although Japan has me uh, red notice on me for get this conspiracy to trespass. Red notice is issued for war criminals, major uh, drug traffickers and uh, uh, you know, all that kind of major crimes. I'm the only person in history to be red noticed for conspiracy to trespass on a whaling ship. Didn't even do it. Mm. <laughs> I guess <laughs> put on there for thinking about doing it. Although what they're really angry about is that over 10 years, we shut down their a, unlawful operations in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. And I believe that Japan is getting ready to go back to the Southern Ocean. And we need to be ready to, uh, to confront them when they do. Why? This year they had two uh, so-called research vessels, two harpoon vessels down in Antarctica doing that kind of work. They're not killing whales, but they're doing the research. But back in Japan, they're completing a hundred no, a $67 million construction of a new factory ship. And the only reason you need a factory ship is to go to the Southern Ocean and kill whales. So when they return in 2024, we intend to be there to meet them. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, just... Like when I heard they would stop fishing, I was kind of surprised. Uh, to me, it was unexpected. So uh, they, do you know why they did that? Is there like, because um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to understand why suddenly they, they decided to stop. Well, it wasn't suddenly. It was over 10 years. We were cutting into their profits every single year. Uh, yeah. And 2012, 2013, they only took 10% of their quota because we, we we blockaded them and harassed them every step of the way. Most years mm -hmm. they got only 30% of the quota or you know 20%, but in, the, in 2013, they got only 10%. It, we cost them literally hundreds of millions of dollars, which is why I'm on the Interpol red notice list. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what people need to remember is everything they've done, done down there, everything they intend to do is a violation of international law. They were brought Absolutely. Before. National Court yeah. of Justice in 2014 and told that they were in violation of the law. They stopped whaling for one year and then resumed it again, They're just ignoring the, interna the International Court of Justice. So unfortunately, the International Court of Justice or the International Whaling Commission have no enforcement body. So mm -hmm. somebody has to be that enforcement body. Sea Shepherd's not going to do it anymore. So uh, I intend to continue doing it. You know, yeah. I, I, my lifelong ambition was to eradicate the perversion of whaling in my lifetime. And we've done a lot. I think 90% of it has been has been stopped. We stopped Australia and Spain and Peru and Chile and South Africa. 
Uh, now whaling has been, um, is only taking place in the territorial waters of Iceland, Norway, Denmark, and Japan. But next year we expect Japan to expand that out again into international waters. It's a lifelong fight. It's one that uh, I, I've dedicated my life to. I don't see any retirement on this. And uh, you know, every whale's life, every whale life saved to me is, is a victory. I believe that whales are highly intelligent, self-aware, sentient beings, but they're of an intelligence that we don't understand. I was debating a whaler a few years ago who said, you know, well, Watson, you say whales are uh, more intelligent than people. How can you say such a stupid thing? I said, well, because uh, they're more intelligent than people. And uh, you just, it's by you measure your criteria. The criteria I use is the ability to live in harmony with your natural ecosystem, your world. That to me is the definition of intelligent. And he looked at me and said, well, by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than people. I said, you know what? Now you're beginning to understand exactly what I'm telling you about. Mm. Cockroaches. That's why cockroaches have been around for a billion years or whatever, because they live in harmony with their natural environment. Absolutely. We don't do that. We're not intelligent. Ecologically, we're not intelligent. We measure intelligence by high to eye to hand coordination. If a blob of protoplasm steps out of a spaceship with a ray gun, oh, automatically, that's an intelligent being because it's got technology. We don't understand non-manipulative intelligences. I mean, look at the dogs that are in Turkey and Syria right now. What kind of intelligence do they have? They can find bodies, they can find living people, they can distinguish if the people are alive or not. They're saving lives. That is an intelligence. They, uh, you know, our sense of smell is nothing compared to what they have. So if you measure it by the criteria of all factory cat criteria, dogs are far more intelligent than we are. But if you yeah. measure it by the, the brain size, whales and dolphins have bigger brains than we have, more um, complicated brains, more of their, their four-part brains to our three-part brains. The convolutions on the neocortex area of whales and dolphins are far more pronounced than we are. There's more brain area. Their ability to communicate is far, far greater, superior than anything that we have. We don't know what they're capable of. We know they have music. We know that uh, dolphins know call each other by their first name. We know that. Uh, we don't know, but they don't need to drive around in cars. They don't need to have telephones. A blue whale can communicate with another blue whale from a thousand miles away. They, these are intelligent creatures, and we're destroying them and wiping yeah. them off. And that is unforgivable. Human beings are a destructive, destructive uh, species. And if we don't learn to live in harmony with all of those other species, we are not going to survive. Yeah, those species, they actually, they don't destroy the environment. They live with their environments. That we destroy our environment. Yeah, that that's uh, that's interesting. And um, well, what are the biggest challenges the foundation is face is faces um right now in its efforts to protect marine life? And how do you plan to overcome them? Well, the biggest challenge we have right now is Sea Shepherd USA is suing me, saying I have no right to use my name. Sea Shepherd Global is suing Sea Shepherd France, saying they don't have any right to use the logos or, that I created. Uh, so these are this is costing us a lot of money. Uh, taking on the whalers, that's the easy part. But the betrayal uh, by the people who were former crew members, former friends, actually, mm -hmm. is our, our biggest challenge. But I think we'll overcome it. I think yeah. that we'll get out there and we will set an example this summer that we're, we're back, that we can make a difference. And we're going to continue doing what we've always done. And we intend to be in the Southern Ocean next year when the Japanese whaling fleet returns and we intend to stop them. Uh, that's what I do best. That's what I'm going to do and continue to do. All right, that's that's remarkable. Um, my last question would be, how can we, how can individuals and communities get involved in the foundation's mission? What, what what can we do to help you? Well, we need all the support we can get. So just go to yeah. the uh, website to the Captain Paul Watson Foundation or the Paul Watson Foundation. Uh, we're also on social media. And, uh, you know, I have to build up a support base that was taken away from me. So we're trying to regain that, poor, the, the support base. The best thing is that people become monthly supporters. That gives us a secure, a secure support base in order to operate the ships and uh, get out there and do, and do the campaigns. And it's building up slowly, but it is building up. And uh, you know, we don't, uh, you know, we don't have a bureaucracy uh, in that way. And uh, the great thing, that one of the one of most wonderful things about this is the people coming to crew the ships and everything are my former colleagues, officers, yeah. 
who have been down there to the Southern Ocean with me. So we're not going down, we're going down and operating with an experienced crew of people who are sticking, sticking with us. So that, that, that gives me a great deal of, uh, of, of, str of strength to go forward. Yeah, I think you have a lot of supporters that like people really believe in what you are doing and what the, the foundation is going to do. So, I mean, that, that's awesome. Maybe it's going to take a little time, but I mean, look, the, the foundation was uh, from like six months ago, I believe. And you already have one boat almost ready to go. So that, that's incredible. And also we're working closely with Sea Shepherd France, UK and Brazil and Hungary. Yeah. They're not all abandoned now. So some still believe in, in, that, in, in that straightforward approach and still believe that aggressive nonviolence is a strategy to pursue. Uh, my big uh, disappointment with Sea Shepherd Australia is they actually have a partnership with a Austral Fisheries, a fishing company. Uh, they're working with a fishing company, but not just any fishing company. Austral Fisheries is 50% owned by the Japanese company um, Marua Daichiro, which is the same company that used to be Taiyu Fishing Company that owned the pirate whaler Sierra that I hunted down and put out of business back in 1979. So that's a real slap in the face for them to be working with a company that actually once owned the pirate whaler Sierra. Uh, why are they doing that? Well, Austral Fisheries helped them to get a tax exempt status in Australia. They've given them donations. They've given them a ship, uh, sold them a ship at a discounted price. So, you know, they say, oh, so they've been sort of enticed into doing that. It can be one thing for sure, Austral Fisheries, which was a tooth fishing, uh, fishing operation in the Southern Ocean will never be opposed by Sea Shepherd Australia. But if we see them down there, we're certainly going to oppose them. Yeah. But do you think they're going to go there? <laughs> well, Austral Fisheries is down there all the time, uh, you know, going after, uh, you know, toothfish. Now, what is a toothfish? Nobody really know, heard of it except under its marketing name. Uh, Antarctic and Patagonia toothfish are marketed under the name of Chilean sea bass. They're not from Chile and they're not a bass, but it's a marketing term. They're an endangered mm -hmm. And it's really a horrible fishery. They call it sustainable. They actually call this a sustainable fishery. You pull a toothfish from two kilometers from the bottom of, of the Southern Ocean. You put it in a ship into a refrigerated container. You haul it to the nearest port. You put it on an airplane. You fly it to New York. You fly it to Boston or London and serve it as an expensive dish called Chilean sea bass. That is not a sustainable fishery. It's an endangered species. And look at the incredible carbon footprint. Uh, of that of that one fishery, yet Austral Fisheries and Sea Shepherd Australia call that sustainable. You know, like they use that word sustainable over and over and over. How is it sustainable? I mean, how can they justify the fact that it's sustainable? How do you justify it? Do that? By saying it is. <laughs> All you have to do is put that word out there. This is a sustainable yeah. forest operation. This is a sustainable mining operation. This is a sustainable car production company. That's all you have to do is you insert the word sustainable and there you go. Yeah, the fact is there's no specific regulation around that word. Like you can basically name everything sustainable even if it's not. And nobody is, questioned, is questioning that or? Well, I'm, questioning. Just take it? I'm, I'm certainly questioning Besides it. Besides you, of course. <laughs> there, there is no sustainable fishing operation on this yeah. planet except for if some guy goes out of his canoe in the Philippines or Nigeria and catches a fish on a line to feed his family, that is sustainable. Super trawlers, gill netters, long liners, uh, purse seiners, not sustainable by any mm -hmm. stretch of the imagination. Last, uh, last year, we caught one super trawler uh, off the coast of Ireland that dumped 100,000 blue whiting because they didn't target that fish. They didn't want it, so they just dumped it. 100,000 fish floating on the surface of the ocean. And it's illegal under EU regulations, but nobody does anything. The killing of dolphins in the Bay of Biscay by the French trawling fleet is illegal under EU regulations. Under French law, it's illegal, but nobody's doing anything about it. We see the violation of ecological laws all over this planet, but there's a lack of economic and political motivation to do anything about it. There are too many hands in too many pockets and, uh, you, you know, politicians, well, we get, I mean, they, they, you, they get their money. And I mean, it was Mark Twain who actually called the United States Congress the parliament of whores. I mean, they, they, they basically represent the people who give them the money to, uh, to, rep to be represented. 
and nobody is there to enforce the law actually they can oh. do whatever they want nobody's going to see anything at sea i mean well they don't even enforce it in their own waters really you know yeah so <laughs> but when, All right. you're, when you're looking at the high seas you're looking at the wild west no laws you know there's yeah. no sheriff there in town uh and when people accuse us of being vigilantes i say well enforce the law there won't be a need for vigilantes when people accuse me of being an eco-terrorist i simply say i've never worked for monsanto and never intend to i am not an eco-terrorist uh mm -hmm. it are corporations that are terrorizing our environment we are trying to protect it we're trying to do it and we're doing it without hurting anybody never injured a single person in my entire career that's great all right um do you have anything to add captain Bor watson for us no thank you just for having me and i uh, hope you come by and see the ship when we're in new york harbor in late may oh uh, we definitely will we definitely will you know we visit one of your ship like back yeah probably like eight nine years ago that was in france uh in les abdolon that was a sailboat and that was the actually the first i mean your shift one of the sea shepherd um uh, ship and that was a, a great experience so yeah of course we'll come by Definitely. <laughs> well, over the last few decades, you know, I built up a Navy, which became the Sea Shepherd Navy. And now I'm going to start building up another Navy. And we've got uh, two ships now, later this year, another one. So we're, we're, getting, we're getting there, we're going there, and uh, we're going to be just as powerful as we were before. Well, thank you so much. I mean, thank you very much uh, for your time. I know you're busy and uh, we appreciate it a lot. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> um, well, now it's um, uh, uh, time to talk with Emily, that I'm going to unmute you, Emily. Uh, welcome, Emily. And um, you're with uh, both, um, sorry, I'm losing my words. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Paul. Yes. Uh, Peace Boat US. Right. <laughs> Director of Peace Boat US. That's right. No, it's great to hear Paul's uh, stories. Each time you know, we hear about his dedication to conservation, especially in protecting whales, uh, it's really so important that we make sure we understand the intelligence, as he said, of the animals that surround us in the ocean and that we really work to conserve them. So I'm really um, looking forward to celebrating this day with all of you. And thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Yeah, it's it's a great pleasure, and uh, yeah, we are, um, you know, I think we are all dedicated in our way to protect our oceans, and uh, we all believe that it's so important. And um, yeah, it's great to have you here and hear about um, uh, about your nonprofit. I'm gonna make you the host of this um, uh, of this um, Zoom, and you're gonna be able to share. Uh, with us about Peace Boat uh, US. Um, can you, yeah, can you tell us more about Peace Boat US? Uh, that was the, my first time hearing about Peace Boat US, and sure. I, I'm, I'm really in, interested. Well, yes, thank you so much, Benjamin. And again, just it's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to be talking about a quite different ship, I think, uh, more focused on education, focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and work towards peace uh, and sustainability through our onboard programs. So as we're talking today a lot about ocean conservation, of course, this is a very important topic to us as we are sailing on the open sea. So Peaceful was started um, around 39, 40 years ago. We're actually now celebrating our 40th anniversary. Uh, we've traveled the world since 1983, working towards peace and sustainability through programs on board the ship and also in more than 100 ports of call around the world. We take with us around 1,000 participants on board the ship as we're traveling. And you can see here, this is our ship now. This is the Pacific World, which is going to be our new ship starting from April, which is very exciting for us. We haven't been sailing during the pandemic, so we've changed our ship over the years as Peaceboat has been growing. In 1983, when we started, uh, Yoshio Katatsuya, who is the founder and the current director of the organization, started with a very small very sized ship with Japanese university students traveling from Japan to China and Korea and Asia. 
And later after 1990, we started our very first global voyage, which you can see here, our global voyages for peace. We have three global voyages now per year and on each global voyage visiting 20 countries. So you can see here, we have the red line going to the Northern hemisphere. You can see the green line going to the Southern hemisphere. And in each global voyage, we work with different partners uh, around the world to bring awareness to various topics uh, from NGO leaders, environmental advocates, uh, government and United Nations partners um, in each country. On the whole of our ship, we have this logo painted on the ship itself. So every time we are docking in ports, we are raising awareness for the United Nations Sustainable Development mm -hmm. Goals. This logo, many of you probably are familiar with, it represents those 17 goals of the United Nations to achieve sustainability by 2030. We also use the ship as a venue for celebrations and for major events during the year. This was the United Nations World Oceans Day, which was celebrated in New York City. And we work very closely with the Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, Duales at the UN to raise awareness on this day. And we are co-hosting also the working group of the UN World Oceans Day and coordinating NGOs to raise awareness uh, for each year's different themes around ocean conservation. In the ports that we visit, we also have programs. So I wanted to give some examples as well, uh, where mm -hmm. we take action for ocean conservation through beach cleanups, through planting of mangroves or um, restoration of the coastal ecosystems. And we always encourage uh, young people to come on board with us and to share their passion and to be part of our programs, especially because Peace Boat was started by university students. We have a lot of young okay. people come on board. And we have one short um, explanation, which I'll share with you a video in a few moments. Um, but our main purpose really is sailing for socially and environmentally responsible tourism, as we believe travel in itself can also be a tool for positive social and political change. On um, the right hand photo, you can also see some of the whale conservation and awareness raising that we did in Patagonia. We work very closely in the southern region of Argentina and Chile, where we often sail from Ushuaia to Punta Arenas, sailing through the fjords of Patagonia. And there are many whales in that area. So we're also working to protect them and to raise awareness about that conservation of Patagonia in the region. Um, and with that, I'd like to share a short video so you can learn more about our work for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, board. sure, absolutely. Please let me know if you can hear it okay. Mm, I'm not sure there's a sound. <laughs> I think you have to share the sound with your uh, stream. Good. You got it. So as you can see, we do quite a lot more than just ocean conservation, but we actually work on all of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And as I mentioned, because we are traveling at sea, 
a lot of our work yeah. is around education, especially for SDG number four, around quality education, and then also working towards ocean conservation by raising awareness about all these different topics on board the ship through our guest educators, especially those who are focused on uh, climate action and ocean conservation worldwide. On board the ship, we also have many guest speakers who are from indigenous communities as we really believe that traditional knowledge is very important to share if we're working towards sustainable development. Here you can see Nobel Peace Laureate Rigoberto Menchu from Guatemala who came on board to share her wisdom with us in Latin America. And we also believe it's very important to share the voices of youth. So we have started this Ocean and Climate Youth Ambassador Program with young people from small island developing states or large ocean states to also share their best practices and solutions for all the challenges that they're facing around climate change and ocean degradation. We've had this program uh, traveling with us on board the ship and more recently have also invited some of the youth from this program to join us at major United Nations conferences such as COP, the United Nations Climate Change Conference and others such as the UN uh, Ocean Conference as well. There is also a possibility to be volunteers on board. So with young people joining us throughout the voyage, we have many opportunities to find ways where they can join also as volunteers to support the work of Peace Boat. And this is also how I joined the organization. I was a Spanish teacher as a volunteer on board. And we have many volunteers who join our GET program, which is Global English and Espanol Training. In the ports of call, we also have many volunteer activities. I uh, hear you can see doing beach cleanups or reforestation of the mangroves or hosting events on board. And of course, because our office in New York City is located in the United Nations Plaza, we also have many volunteer and internship opportunities for young people to join us here as well. Our organization was founded in Japan, as I mentioned in 1983, and spent many years focused in our Tokyo office. And I also worked there for many years. And then I moved to New York City, where I am now coordinating our office in the United Nations Plaza. Uh, we have an office where we are working with the United Nations to participate in many conferences and also bringing young people to share their voice at the table. We believe it's really important to also support the education of young people to have the experience to go into the United Nations, but also to gain the hands-on experience of working with an international NGO. So you can see our office here in the UN Plaza. And we like to be also the bridge um, between civil society, NGOs, and the United Nations. So supporting the role of civil society and working towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals and bringing that voice also back to the UN. Our young people are very active in climate action, ocean conservation, and as you mentioned in the introduction earlier, Benjamin, Peace Vote holds special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the UN, ECOSOC, uh, so we are participating in many of those conferences, and we understand that the time to act is now. We really don't have any time to waste, so we are working very diligently especially towards uh, the UN SDGs, but also in participating in UN major conferences. This year uh, marks the beginning um, of our work sailing on our new ship towards also the UN ocean decade. So as we think about whale conservation and ocean conservation in general, we can support this decade from 2021 to 2030. The United Nations has declared this a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And with that, we've created a scholarship to support this endeavor we already have so many young people traveling with us, as I mentioned, on board the ship and as volunteers, but we have now created this scholarship to encourage more young people who are already dedicated to climate action, ocean conservation, and all of the SDGs to join us on board through this program. It's mostly for ages 18 to 30 years old for this particular scholarship. And we invite young people to apply throughout the year. And here you can see a few photos of our last trip to Patagonia, to the fjords. Um, in Argentina and Chile and some of our youth scholars. And these young people really learn from experts on board and they see how the SDGs are being implemented locally in the countries that we visit. We also take them to the United Nations headquarters in other areas of the world, such as the UNDP office in Panama, where you can see this photo here. And then we also do homestay programs that work with local communities in each country. So once they see how the SDGs are being implemented from the high level of the UN, then we go to the grassroots level of working with local communities. Now, this is the Embera community in Panama, which we'll actually be visiting very soon for the Our Ocean Conference in Panama, which is taking place at the end of this month, starting February 27th to March 5th. There will be a conference focused on ocean conservation. And we also believe it's important to have these gathering venues and participate in conferences to bring the voice of indigenous communities and civil society 
to major partners around the world. Through this program for the Youth for the SDGs, we also visit many regions of the world uh, focused on climate action and seeing what kind of solutions we can find, but also looking um, at biomimicry and nature's patterns, so spending time in nature and learning about uh, how we can interact in harmony with nature, as Captain Paul Watson also said, and that's really important, I think, to start from a young age. So we're working with our youth to visit rainforests, to visit oceans. And this is from Belize, where we got to get in the water and do some snorkeling and learn about life below water, seeing the sharks, seeing the stingrays, and interacting with this natural habitat and learning more about how we can work to protect them together. We also try to leave uh, every place cleaner than we found it. So we do a lot of beach cleanups in the coastal regions as we're visiting so many ports every year. And we know that the ocean plastic pollution is a major issue that we have to tackle. And so we've worked with My World Mexico and other uh, groups around the world to do beach cleanups as well. And sometimes using art. We also are raising awareness for ocean conservation through painting murals and leaving a mark in the different places that we visit and getting community members involved for some more fun kind of activities you can see here, the painting of the whales on the walls at the university. This is in Guadalajara in Mexico and participating in more uh, conservation efforts to raise awareness at universities and public spaces as a public uh, show of our awareness um, and what we're working towards for conservation. So as we have this logo painted on our ship and so many young people working towards the SDGs, uh, we are trying to also interact uh, with more communities in coastal areas um, in that conservation of protecting the mangroves which we also know are so important to our ecosystems. So you can see here some examples of mangrove reforestation that we've been doing. And they're kind of the key ecosystem of supporting those coastal areas from erosion and also uh, during these natural disasters, which are increasing every day with climate change. Uh, we also work with local organizations that support conservation of waterways in the ocean. So this is in Singapore, where we did a waterway wash cleanups and also so visiting the fjords of Patagonia, this is a bit more closer look at some of the organizations that we work with. One partner um, in Chile is CODES, is a national committee to protect the flora and fauna of Chile. And so each year that we go to Patagonia, we're working very closely with these nonprofits and these ecosystems, which are incredible places that we admire so much. And we know that the glaciers also are some of the last resources um, that we rely on for freshwater and conservation. So with that, it's given us so much momentum for change. Here you have the founder, Yoshio Katatsia, along with our team and Ban Ki-moon from the United Nations. This is in a previous conference around shipping. And we really believe that in order to change the shipping industry, we have to change it from the inside out. So Peaceboat is working on our biggest endeavor yet, which is the Peaceboat Eco, which will be a ship that will sail with solar and wind panels and will reduce our CO2 by 30 to 40% in our transit across the oceans, producing the energy that we need on board. We will have an ocean research laboratory and a conservation space on board. We hope to have a wet lab and a dry lab in the future to really learn from the ocean as we're traveling at sea. And we'll also have a kinetic energy dance floor to help us create that energy as we're traveling. We all have a biosphere inside, a kind of real ecosystem where we can learn about nature and biomimicry and all of nature's patterns as we're traveling. And this will be the new EcoShip design. So we're hoping that this can inspire, uh, as it is based actually off of the design of a whale. Uh, the shape itself is also more aerodynamic and fitting with nature's pattern. And you can see here the wind sails um, and solar panels are retractable so they can go up and down as we are sailing. And this ship will hold around 2,500 passengers. So we're hoping that this will be a larger space for us to be able to work within the communities that we visit, to bring guest speakers on board who have expertise in the field, to have NGOs and civil society working together. And we hope that you will join us in this collaboration towards creating the world's first eco-friendly cruise ship, which can work towards conservation of the oceans, education, and helping us to achieve the sustainable development goals. So I think that hopefully we can be a vessel that can provide more educational opportunities uh, for all of these important topics and celebrate World Whale Day, hopefully on board the ship next year with all of you. Oh, Benjamin, I think you're still muted, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, th thank you so much, Emily, for that presentation. Uh, uh, we had some, um, yeah, some people wants to know more about this uh, new ship 
uh, are you actually building this ship right now or is it a, still a project we are building the ship yes we um, oh, right now awesome. we're, we're sailing on the Pacific world with the our ship from April and we hope that definitely uh, in the next few years we'll have the eco ship ready to sail on so we're still looking for more partners and those who are interested in being part of this project so if you are interested um, you can let me know. You can reach our contact on the website, info at peaceboat-us.org. And yes, very soon we will be sailing on the eco ship. Definitely hope to have it, you know, sailing to represent the sustainable development goals before 2030. By 2030. Okay. Yeah, we have a question on uh, on Facebook uh, by Suzanne, who, is, who she's asking, when is the new ship ready? <laughs> Will that yes. boat come to New York? <laughs> as soon as possible, yes. We are looking for so many partners, investors, and those who can help us to build this kind of ship, and also ship experts and those who have experience in green shipping. Right now, we have so many partners um, from Norway to Finland and Sweden who are really creating those green corridors in the ocean of conservation and, and working towards renewable energy shipping. So I hope that we can have more people joining us in the future. Yeah, to my knowledge, it's going to be the first ship of uh, its kind, no? Like cruise it will. ship. Yes, absolutely will be the first of its kind. I'll well, put the chat. Uh, also, I'll put the link for the eco ship if you all would like to see. I'll put it on the Facebook page. Um, yeah, yeah EcoShip's website, And people can learn more there also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of interest uh, around that ship. And because, yeah when you you talk about environment and cruise ship you, you might think that it's not really um uh, uh i would say eco-friendly but yeah seeing you having this uh incredible project of the eco ship it's it's awesome thank you yes we also agree the shipping is not the... where it needs to be yet so yeah. we have a long way to go and we're doing this as a um, project because we realized that in order to have a more sustainable ship it needs to come from those who are sailing and we hope that we can create this to be an example to be a shift for the maritime industry for those who yeah. can join us on board mm -hmm. yeah there's another question is plan i mean maybe it's too early to uh uh in, in the project but uh, the question is about your plans for gray water and black water in the ship Absolutely. Yeah, we, we do have, if you look at the website link, you can see the design of the ship and it has a PDF box. You can, you can see more of the design of, of the systems inside, but we do plan to recycle the gray water and black water to make sure that we have the most sustainable ship. And this is why we're building it from scratch. A lot of people ask us, why don't you retrofit another boat? And why don't you, you know, add solar panels or wind sails to another boat? But we understand that if you don't build the ship from scratch, from zero, you're not going to have all the inside systems set to be the most sustainable that it can. So we yeah, understand probably. that we have, we have mm. to do it from, from the beginning so that it does um, take into account all the practices. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's another question on Facebook, and I actually wanted to ask you that question myself. So what, what are the um, uh, Peace Boat initiative in, uh, currently in, uh, in uh, New York? Do you have any active... Um, initiative in New York? Absolutely, we can... yes, we do. Yeah. We have so many activities. We're a very small team in New York. I'm, I'm working there by myself for the past 11 years, uh, but we do have uh, a large team in Tokyo uh, supporting all of the ship operations and programs and guest speakers. Um, but in New York City, because the United Nations headquarters is there, we're also very active in, in educating and raising awareness. And, and also um, creating so many programs with internships as well, having young people on board and uh, working together to um, promote uh, climate week, world oceans week. There's kind of these different times of the year when we have many active programs. Uh, so I'll be very happy to welcome anyone to join us. If you're in New York City, you can send us an email. I'll put the info at email uh, in the chat as well. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, yeah, I see you just put the um, email address on, on Facebook. Thank you so much, Emily. Do, would you like to add anything to the to the chat? Yeah, I would just say, you know, in the end, um, if you are interested in joining us, we're planning, I know already this year for World Oceans Day, many activities and beach cleanups. We did a bike ride to the beach to Coney Island last year with many people. And I will be joining that again with the United Nations World Oceans Day on June 8th. 
So you all can look forward to that and maybe join us as part of the Friends of World Ocean State group. And so mm -hmm. we look forward to having you be part of the programs and, and building out this community of ocean conservation together. Yeah, we'll definitely stay in touch. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, it's 12 o'clock, so we're going to finish that event. Um, I, I would like to thank you, um, you, Emily, and Paul Watson uh, for being here today. I want also to thank you, everybody who, who uh, attended to this event. Um, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity, because without you guys we, we obviously can do it so uh, i'm very grateful uh, i'm also grateful um uh that uh, julie my partner i spoke about her at the beginning but i want to thank you thanks her again because she gave me the opportunity to be your host today and uh, and uh, i really enjoyed it and thank you so much thank you everybody um you'll be able to see that um uh, that meeting back on Facebook pretty soon, I guess. And uh, have a good one and enjoy your Sunday. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Wednesday. <laughs> Happy Sunday, absolutely. Ciao. Bye.